back to our introduction to OpenMP in small bytes. My name is Christian Terboven from RWTH Aachen University. The topic of this video is fault sharing. Fault sharing is a general concept, but it touches OpenMP parallel programs because multiple threads might work with shared memory. So in the first part of the video, I will explain fault sharing and how it relates to OpenMP. In the second part of the video, I will cover one example, a simple code to approximate Pi, which does not directly relate to fault sharing, but instead is intended to provide a summary of the topics that we have been discussing in this and previous videos so far. Let me emphasize that fault sharing is hardware specific. This is not a general OpenMP concept. And we can encounter fault sharing, which is a performance problem or a limitation of performance and scalability, as we will see, because multiple threads work on a shared memory. It, because of that, it applies to OpenMP, but it can also apply to all the other shared memory parallel programming models. Before I explain what fault sharing is, let me first motivate why we have caches and then remember, or let me remember you what caches are about. This is a figure from a famous book and corresponding talks from John Hennessy and David Patterson, who closely monitored and presented computer architecture in their corresponding books and talks. So what they are showing here is that the rate at which the performance of processors measured as using the spec in benchmark as a pair core metric is increasing much faster, so the performance is much increasing much, much faster than the performance of the memory subsystem, going back to some point in 1980. Here the performance of the memory subsystem is measured as latency. So the figure says it, in um, the memory subsystem we see since 1980 an uh, average performance improvement in latency per year of 1.07. So that's less than 10%. While on the processor single core performance measured with spec int, we see increases between 25 and a little bit above 50%, depending on the range of years you're looking at. So processors were becoming faster and faster at a higher rate than the memory. And if we have programs that depend on data and memory, which is in particular in scientific technical computations pretty often the case, fast processors might just have to wait for memory to, uh, for data to arrive from the memory, which is not productive. This is the high level motivation for why we have caches. So CPUs are fast, memory is slow, so we need something in between. And uh, caches are this something in between, and in modern processors we have three levels of cache hierarchy. We have a very small L level one cache, often referred to just as L1 cache, which holds on the one hand the data that the program is working with, so in the order of 32 to 64 kilobyte, depending on the processor version and the processor architecture, and also the instructions like the current loop and a little bit around it of the program that's ex executing. Often these caches are divided into a separate data and instruction cache. Then we have the L2 cache, which is uh, in most current systems a couple of megabyte in size. And often the level 2 cache is shared among the logical threads and sometimes even among some physical cores within the same processor. And then in current systems we have so-called level 3 caches, which often are 30, 40, 50 megabyte, yeah, which are then shared among all or at least a significant subset of the cores within one processor. So caches are fast. Yeah? The level one cache can be accessed in one or let's say a handful of cycles. L2 cache is larger but slower. L3 cache again is larger but again slow, slower. So the further the level, uh, the cache level is away from the processor, the larger it can get, but also the slower it will be in the main memory then uh, is probably the largest and the slowest uh, memory available in the node. However, if you take a look at uh, how the computer architecture is de developing, 
you can see different kinds of memories. So in recent architectures, we have seen high bandwidth memory in addition to the traditional main memory. And also there might be something what I would call high capacity memory, which is like non-volatile memory. So the hierarchy of the memory is growing in order to provide in overall a better uh, ratio of capacity, price and performance. The fast memory is much more expensive than the slower memory. What does it mean for us as a programmers? Well, in most cases, this is uh, transparent because the system handles the transfer of data from the memory via the caches to the processor back and forth. But we can see the implications of that in the execution speed of our program. And uh, with this figure here, I'm showing the performance difference between the level one cache, level two cache and level three cache on a rather old architecture. It's an Intel Westmere uh, processor. But the, the nice thing about this processor is that you can sh see sharp differences in the performance measurement between the different caches. So let me explain what we are seeing here. Here on the X axis, you see the memory footprint of a certain kernel, which I will explain in a second. And here on the Y axis, you see the latency in nanoseconds. So the kernel is something that I would call pointer chasing. So it loads an address and then in this address, the value is the next address to load and so forth. And these addresses have been prepared to form a ring. And then the overall distance of the different addresses, meaning the maximum span between these addresses, is then the memory footprint that I'm showing here. And you can imagine, yeah, if you do that a couple of times, all those addresses can sit within the cache. And as long as uh, the cache size of or the size of the individual cache, like uh, 32 kilobyte of the level one cache, is not exceeded after. Um, one or two iterations, the addresses will remain within the level one cache. And that means we can measure the actual latency of loading data from the L1 cache to the processor. As soon as we exceed the level one cache in the distances, the level two cache becomes visible. Then we have the level three cache. And here we see the, diff um, the accesses to the main memory shown as a latency in second, as a significant difference in the, um, laten in the latency time and uh, in consequence in the speed of memory accesses. So it is visible, it can be measured, and there's a difference in terms of speed, a significant one, um, depending from where the data is loaded. Yeah? So roughly from main memory to L1 cache, there's a factor of 10. So how do caches work in more detail? I'm not going into computer architecture here. I'm just trying to give us an abstract view, which is uh, sufficient in order to understand um, the implications for you as a parallel programmer. So when data is being loaded in your program, for example, it, if it wants to compute x plus y, uh, x equals y plus five, it has to load y, uh, which is a current variable residing in the main memory, and then add five and write the result to the memory location that is denoted by the variable X. When data is uh, used, it's uh, um, loaded from the main memory via the cache hierarchy. There are differences depending on the current architecture, which we are ignoring here. So there are direct loads, there are indirect loads and so forth. And um, the same applies when uh, then data, the result of the computation is written back to X. So either it could be uh, go, it could go through the cache hierarchy or it could be a direct write to a location in the memory. And this is outside the scope of this lecture on OpenMP. But what, import, what is important for us is that when data is loaded from the main memory, X, uh, Y for example, not only the single variable Y is loaded, but instead a so-called cache line is loaded. The cache line is a chunk of data which possibly uh, contains not only y but a few other variables as well. A cache line on most current systems is something like uh, the size of eight double elements. 
and why is it useful and why is a system organized in, in so-called cache lines? First, this is uh, important to limit the overhead of cache coherency, as we will see in a second. But also, it helps to improve the performance of the system and the application running on the system by increasing the, um, the rate um, by which the cache is being used. And we talk about temporal locality and spatial locality when uh, caches are being useful. Yeah, so if you remember the previous example where we are iterating um, the pointer chasing in a kind of ring. So if data is used frequently, that means the next time it's used, it's still in the cache. We have a performance advantage because we don't have to load it from the memory, but data is in the cache. But similarly, similarly, we also can exploit spatial locality or caches exploit spatial locality to improve the performance of the parallel program. So if we think of Y to be an array, yeah, if we load Y0, because of a cache line, we also get y a Y1, Y2, Y3 and so forth loaded into the cache of the processor. And uh, that uh, is a good idea if instead of only using Y0, uh, we also need Y1, Y2. Yeah? So if Y is uh, an array of double elements, we just have to issue one load in order to update eight variables. Yeah? So we only have to pay the overhead of loading data from the memory once. This is, um, as a brief summary, why we have the caches organized in cache lines. So remember, whenever we, um, the program loads data from the main memory, it loads at least one cache line. This is what I'm trying to illustrate here. If this core loads data from the memory, it gets the cache line. And then if the data is reused frequently, we talk about temporal locality, or if we are using uh, neighbor, neighbor data, so that needs two or more variables or area elements of the same cache line, we're exploiting spatial locality. So now what is fault sharing? Well, this good thing of that the system and the caches are organized in so-called cache lines can also limit the performance. Now remember we have a parallel program. We have two threads, one running on this bluish core and the other running on this reddish core. Assuming that we have two threads that access data on the same cache line and both threads modify data on the same cache line. This is then where the system has a problem because it has to flip the cache line back and forth between the two cores, possibly on two different sockets. And uh, that means it always have, has uh, to make one thread wait for uh, the other to complete, for example, one update of the data. Although there's no real data dependency induced by our algorithm or program fold or whatever. So this is just a performance problem, not a correctness issue. Let me try to illustrate. Assume we have an array, uh, which is uh, residing in the main memory, and one thread is going to load A0, and the other thread is going to load A1, and both perform an update. Just for example, because we have a parallel for loop and use the chunk size of uh, one. This is what happens. The first thread loads the cache line, performs the update. The second thread has to load uh, the cache line and perform the update and so forth. And if we not only do that once, but multiple times, this is what happens. Constantly, one of the two threads has to wait for the data to arrive, not from the main memory, but from the cache from the other thread. If the two threads run on two cores that share most of the cache hierarchy, that might not be much of an issue, performance issue that's visible. But if these two threads write, uh, execute on a different socket, the data has to travel via the interconnect, the bus, whatever, depends on your architecture from socket zero to socket one and so forth. I hope you appreciate this PowerPoint animation. <laughs> okay, let's look at the code that is uh, familiar to you, I hope, from the previous video lecture um, or the one before on data scoping. We have the parallel region, we have a for loop, and we want to sum up all the elements of an array A. And we discussed how to do that in parallel. Our solution was to introduce a 
local variable like sp, I think we called it sp for s private, which is used in the parallel computation. And after the parallel computation, we had the critical region where the individual threads partial result or the SPs were added to the global variable S. We could also have come up with a different solution, which is what I'm showing here. So we could come up with an array that's called SPRIV for the private S variables or whatever of a dimension of the number of threads. And then we have the parallel region. Each thread has a certain ID, which I'm uh, storing in the variable t, won't be get thread num, remember this API call. And all the threads are writing to different locations of the array as priv. There's no correctness problem here. And then we have again a loop and um, uh, after the main computation, yeah, here actually after the parallel computation where the partial results are being added to the variable s. If you have, uh, think about what I explained with respect to fault sharing, you might be able to see the issue here already. So this is the performance yeah, for this kind of code on, I believe, the same architecture. Yeah, this is a performance plotted over the number of threads varying from 1 to 12, shown not as time but megaflops. Yeah, so if we are adding array variables, I'm sorry, if we are summing up variables, we are doing floating point operations, if we know the array size and if we know the time it takes, we can compute the performance or the compute rate, which is mega flops. So what we are basically seeing here is that there's no performance benefit in using multiple threads. And the reason is fault sharing of SPRIV. So for the, sake of, for the simple example of only four threads, yeah, this is how it looks like. SPRIV 0, 1, 2 and 3 is uh, residing all on the same cache line, which is what I just explained. And that means all the threads running on different cores are accessing data on the same cache line, which has to travel between all the cores. And this is why we don't see any increase in the performance from using multiple threads. A solution is to avoid that these variables reside on the same cache line. The real solution is to use the code that we have discussed at the end of the previous video, uh, that means to make use of the reduction clocks. But if you would introduce something like padding, that means we have only one variable per cache line, I will show source code in a second, yeah. then we get actual performance improvement. So if you avoid the fault sharing issue here, you can see some kind of uh, good scalability for adding up the uh, values of a single variable just by avoiding fault sharing. So how does the code look like? Well, this is not what you should program. You should use a reduction clause, but I'm just trying to uh, illustrate here how to avoid fault sharing. The dimension of the array as priv is changed to not only uh, n threads, but n threads times eight, which is the number of elements of the current data type uh, that can be stored within a single cache line to make sure um, that the threads do not access uh, the same cache line because this offset or this uh, factor, sorry, that's the right word, is used here as well. So we, we are wasting a little bit of memory, but we are able to significantly improve the performance of our scale, uh, parallel program. As I said in the beginning, fault sharing is not a OpenMP concept, but it's a, a hardware specific concept. There could be architectures that do not um, uh, exhibit the issue of fault sharing. However, most current architectures in principle do so. Now let me come back to, um, again, a general discussion of OpenMP by summarizing a few of the things that we have been learned so far. And I'm uh, using a very simple example, which is an approximation of pi. This is a code I'm using, and it tries to, up, um, to approximate pi by solving this integral from zero to one over this term, yeah, by using a very simple approach of numerical integration. So this term here is captured by the, by the function f, where four divided by one plus x to the power of two. 
then we have one divided by n, n is the number of um, integration points. And we iterate over n and evaluate the function at all those different um, integration points. At the end, um, we uh, multiply the diff distance between two integration points with the partial sum or with the uh, overall sum that we have uh, computed. We can do so in parallel because in principle evaluating the function f at the single point is different from evaluating f at all the other points. However, this code is wrong. It will not approximate pi, it will compute some, let me just call it funny number. Do you see the problem? Maybe you can think about what we learned about scoping, what are private variables and what are shared variables. This makes the code correct. So first the obvious thing, private variable i, this is not really necessary. I can write it like that, this is not wrong, but because i is the loop index variable of a parallelized loop, this is why it will be made private automatically by the compiler. Remember, private means one instance of this variable of a given name for each participating thread. Uninitialized instance, but this is not a problem because i is initialized here. We have to privatize fx as well. Why is that? So fx is fh, which is a constant, times i plus something. Yeah? i is different for each thread in each iteration. That means fx is different for each thread in each iteration. If we do not say private fx, there would only be one fx because fx has been declared before the parallel region. If there's only one fx, threads overwrite each other's, uh, other threads value constantly. And finally, we have to make f sum a reduction. Yeah? So each thread will add an individual value of xx, fx, yeah? f of fx, sorry for that, to f sum. So each thread has to compute the partial result. And then we need the reduction in order to come up with the final result in f sum so that we can compute fh times f sum. What if we would have forgotten this? In, uh, if we would have forgotten the reduction or the privatization, we run into a correctness issue of our program. This is what we call a data race. And this is a typical, here I'm saying OpenMP programming error, but this also applies to any other shared memory or distributed shared memory parallel programming model. When two or more threads access the same memory location, at least one of threads is modifying the memory operation, that means a write. Yeah? The access to these memory locations is not synchronized, not protected by any lock or critical region. Then we have a race condition because the outcome depends on the order in which threads execute the, um, the we call it the critical uh, section. That means a part of the code that is modifying the shared variable. And if it results in a different behavior, for example, different values, then we call this a data race as an actual problem that uh, leads in most cases to a wrong result. You have to understand that these data races are sometimes hard to spot because they are kind of non-deterministic. Because if you run, for example, your program under the control of a debugger, or if you run it on your single uh, core or dual core laptop with other programs open in the background, it might happen that the multiple threads actually do not execute simultaneously, but only one after each other. If that happens, in particular, uh, if the data race only occurs in a program part that is uh, very short in terms of execution time, then this kind of serialized execution will hide that there's a data race because in, in practice it never happens. However, then when you run your program on a compute node in an HPC system where no one else is disturbing it, yeah, no other program is running and so forth, then it might happen. You say, damn it, you go back to your laptop, start the program in the debugger, and again, you will not find the problem because under the debugger, all the program, uh, the program is uh, under the control of the whatever debugger management system. And in most cases, only one thread at a time will be active. So it's hard to fetch 
those or to spot those errors with traditional tools and this is why they are special tools um, for that. So on the following slide I'm saying uh, I'm showing one screenshot of a commercial tool which is the Intel Inspector XE probably it's called differently nowadays but it's a tool from the Intel um, suite. There are other open source tools like Thread Sanitizer that comes with Clang and Archer and so forth. So if you um, would like to hear a recommendation, I would say that you should always run an OpenMP program with one of these tools before putting it into production and relying on the result of this parallel program. Because it's so easy to spot, uh, sorry, not easy to spot, but so easy to forget the private clause, a critical region or something like that. So if you would run the program like that, under the control of Intel Inspector, it actually detects the problems. Yeah? So it tells us here's something wrong with your program. Yeah? There's one problem. It shows us where it happens. Yeah? Remember we have forgotten the reduction. So f sum equals f of fx. There are two threads reading and writing to and from the same uh, data location. And if we do not say f sum to be a reduction variable, yeah, as we uh, crossed it out in the previous code example, then f sum is a shared variable. And again, we have a data race on that shared um, variable. So tools like that can help you to make sure that your real codes are correct. So if you see a data race, I just said in many cases, you forgot the private clause. What happens if we just do uh, put f sum into a private clause? Well, this is also not correct. Yeah? If we have a private variable, that means f sum would be private here in each, uh, for each thread. It would be uninitialized. So here we are reading and adding, uh, reading from and then adding to f sum. So the first read would be um, uninitialized. Yeah, this could lead to wrong results. However, the much more significant problem is that private variables are gone after the parallel region. So here we have the f sum declared and initialized, meaning defined before the parallel region. If we say, say private f sum, each thread is working on its own f sum in the execution of the uh, parallel region. And then here we are back in sequential execution, fh times f sum would be fh times zero. So we would lose all the computation. So a data race in many cases means a critical section or private is missing, but you should always take a look at the data flow. Yeah? If we see something defined before a parallel region, used within a parallel region by being read and updated, and then again used after a parallel region. And it's not an array where threads write to different locations, but a scalar variable then this is a very good hint that you need a reduction clause instead of a privatization. So this uh, uh, should conclude the discussion of the P program. Uh, again, I'm running this on um, one of our compute nodes on the CLEC system for one, two, four, and eight threads. It's a very simple program. So it's a runtime of 1.1 seconds with one thread and 0.1 seconds for eight threads, it's a reasonable speed up seven on eight threads because the scalability is good. That means we have parallelized almost everything of the runtime. There's almost no overhead introduced by our parallelization because the threads go parallel, compute in parallel, and then combine the final results. And at the end of the day, it's a kind of trivial problem because it is embarrassingly parallel by requiring only one reduction. This example of pi was meant to put parallel region and privatization yeah, and shared variable, that means scoping into a perspective and reason about the correctness of our parallel program. With that, I conclude this video.